Ryan, are you talking to me? Because I can't hear you. Oh, I, okay, my bad. <clears throat> All right. It is now a little after 1, August the 26th, 2020, RT210. Uh, we are now going over, we're in G now, which is medical gas therapy. Uh, we lectured yesterday, and that lecture will be up by the time this was done, hopefully. I'm ready to take them over the load. Uh, but it will be up uh, today. And we left off yesterday talking about uh, the low flow devices. We left off talking about low flow devices. And we talked about the indications of a low flow device um, and some of the characteristics of using a low flow device. And now today we're going to actually describe or show the low flow devices that you will see as a respiratory therapist. Um, <clears throat> I also ask you guys to make sure you read very well, look at the pictures, understand the labeling to be able to uh, distinguish the difference between these low flow devices. Okay, so I'm gonna show a couple first and see if anybody remembers. And then I'm gonna go into the, to, into the uh, lecture. All right, the first low flow device I'm going to show you is this one. It has two prongs that go into the nose. The other ends here go into behind the ears, okay? And it tightens up on the chin with this, all right? Connected to a small board tubing that you would hook up to your flow meter, okay? Now, whether that flow meter is a uh, Thorpe flow meter, right, the, the Thorpe tube, or an actual cylinder, you would use a adapter, nipple adapter, sometimes called a Christmas tree. We don't like to call them Christmas trees, but they get called Christmas trees when you get into the field, right? They're going to say, yeah, I need a Christmas tree. All right, that's what they call it. But for NBRC purposes, it's called a nipple adapter, okay? And it will go up on the Thorpe tube here and your oxygen tubing would go to that, okay? Then you would turn on your flow to whatever you, liter flow that is prescribed, two, three, four, five, and so on, okay? Now, so what is this, does anybody remember what this one is called? What is this low flow device called? Nasal cannula. Nasal cannula. This is a bi-nasal cannula. Okay, a nasal cannula. All right? Low flow device totally depends on your ventilatory pattern as far as the FIO2 is concerned. Now, again, today you're going to learn that we can estimate uh, if the patient is breathing normal respiratory pattern, we can estimate about how much FIO2 they're getting if we uh, use the rule of fours, okay? We're gonna learn that today. All right, the next low flow device is a mask that has a small board tubing that attaches to it, okay? There is no valve in here. There is no valve on the side. There is no bag to this one. It's just simply a mask and some tubing, right? Small bore tubing, all right? This also would go to your flow meter, right? 
So what is this low flow device called? You looked at your reading last night. Simple mask. This is a simple face mask. Simple mask. Okay. Simple, also known as SFM. Simple face mask. Okay. You're going to learn the leader flows and all of this for today. You're going to learn how many leaders can I put through these low flow devices. All right. We're going to learn all that today. All right. So this is a simple face mask. Then we get into the ones with bags on them. Okay. Here's one. It is a mask that does have a small bore tube into it that goes to the flow meter, but it has a reservoir bag. Okay? But it does not have a valve in here, a one way valve in here. And it does not have one way valves on the side. See? Doesn't have them on the sides and doesn't have them in here. So if you have a mask, a low flow mask that is has a reservoir bag, but does not have any of the uh, one-way valves in, then this type of mask is called a what? What is this man low flow device called? Non-rebreather mask. Not a non-rebreather because it doesn't have the valve. Uh, rebreather. Partial rebreather. It's called a partial, partial rebreather. rebreather. Good. Partial rebreather has the bag, the mask, but has no valves in it. That means when you exhale through into this mask, some of your gas in from your lungs will go into the bag. And then when you inhale, you're going to get some of your own breath back. Okay, that's why it's called a partial rebreather. You're partially rebreathing some of your own air because there are no one-way valves attached. Okay. All right, so if that's a partial rebreather, then the only one left is the non-rebreather. <clears throat> so let's look at the difference. In the non-rebreather, notice you have these one-way flaps. See these? See that? That allows you to blow air out. They'll pop open when you're blowing air out and you're exhaling, but when you inhale, look, they close. So they'll close on the side, so now you can only get the gas from the bag, and that gas will be coming from your oxygen source, okay? So this will turn on, the bag will fill up, and it has <clears throat> a one-way valve inside as well. So everybody look at this. You have a one-way valve in here. This is a one-way valve in here. Okay, that's a one-way valve there, and it has one-way valves on the side, that side and this side. Again, when you have the mask on, when I have to exhale, I can exhale through these little valves so they'll pop open. They're just little plastic, flimsy little pieces of rubber, right? They allow me to blow out or exhale, but when I suck in, they stay shut, right? It sucks them shut. And now I can only get the gas that is coming from the bag. So I am not rebreathing my own gas, so this is a non-rebreather, right? You're gonna learn the flow values or the flow volumes for these bags <coughs> or for these low flow devices today. Then we're gonna get into our high flow devices. Totally different ball game with those, okay? So you have to know the difference between non-rebreathers and partial rebreathers. Now, look at this. <coughs> Most hospitals will take one of these off, a non-rebreather, okay? They'll just pull it off, right? They'll take it off that way, because what if Mr. Johnson <clears throat> is on his mask and is hooked up, but what if it gets kinked off or somebody pulls it off away from the source? Well, if it's sealed on his face really good, when he tries to exhale or inhale, he can't, right? He can exhale, but when he tries to inhale, if both of these are on there, if both of these are on there, when he inhales, this is gonna be sealed shut. And if there's nothing coming through the bag, he's gonna suffocate. So a lot of hospitals will take one of these off just for safety reasons, okay? So a lot of times when you see non-rebreathers that have one on this side and not one on this side, okay? But I put one back over here so you could see it for explanation's sake. Uh, this is how they come. When you buy, it comes 
with two on both sides because this is a normal breed. We don't want them to breed anything but what we're giving you. Okay, this is the mask that you would use if you were doing a heliox mixture. All right, if we had a person on heliox, which is either 80 20 or 70 30 percent heliox and or helium and oxygen, we want to make sure that they're getting that percentage, right? We don't want to just put it on an, in a nasal cannula. No, you would you would administer heliox with a non rebreather mask, okay. So when you get a test question that says, which device would you use for heliox mixtures? It would be the non-rebreather mask, okay? The non-rebreather mask. Also, the non-rebreather is what we use in the ER when somebody comes in from um, smoke inhalation because we said they're suffering from anemic hypoxemia, right? And that means that their hemoglobin is not allowed to hold oxygen because it's holding carbon monoxide, right? So if that's the case, we have to bombard those hemoglobin with pure oxygen, as much oxygen as we can give it, okay? And then finally, the, helio, the uh, hemoglobin will shake off those carbon monoxide and pull up oxygen, okay? And it takes a little couple hours, all right? It can take a couple hours for that to happen. So if they come in from ER, you're not going to put them on a nasal cannula, right? If they're coming from a smoke fire or something like that, we're going to put them on a normal breather. Probably come in with that from the from the firefighters. Okay, the firefighters will have them already on a normal breather, and that's why we use it, right? So that's the non rebreather mask. So those are our low flow devices. Now I'm going to share my screen. Uh, just want to talk about each one a little more in depth for your notes. All right, low flow devices. The first one's called the nasal cannula. Showed it to you already. The nasal cannula, also known as nasal prones, right? The nasal cannula, also known as the nasal prones. They have some advantages and some disadvantages. Some advantages of the nasal cannula or the nasal prong is economical. They're cheap, okay? They're cheap, they're comfortable for the most part, and the patient, main one is the patient can eat, talk, cough, etc. right? They can eat. If I have a patient who's on a mask but cannot tolerate it coming off to eat, then I need to switch him from a mask to a nasal cannula. That way he can eat and get his oxygen at the same time. Right. There are also some disadvantages. Can y'all see me as well as my screen? Okay. There's also some disadvantages for nasal cannulas. Of course, it's a low flow device, so the FIO2 is imprecise. Remember, we said all low flow devices, you cannot guarantee an FIO2. All right. Can't guarantee. We can estimate, but we can't guarantee. All right, and the next one is obstructed nasal airway interfaces. So what if Mr. Johnson has a lot of boogers, right? And he gets his boogers all caught up in the orifice. Well, then is he getting the oxygen? No. So that's one of the disadvantages, all right? It's going to interfere with his oxygen delivery. And then another thing is that oxygen, medical oxygen, is very, very dry, okay? So having this directly in their nose like that can dry the nasal mucosa. Dry the nasal mucosa because medical oxygen is very, very dry. That's the nasal cannula, all right? Flow ranges. What flows do I put the nasal cannula on? Again, we'll be using the Thorpe tube for your flow meter. This is oxygen. No reason to have a patient on room air. And a nasal cannula, right? We wouldn't have never had the hook the room there for what, right? If they need oxygen, we're gonna have them on oxygen, okay? So this is the green flow meter. So this is the oxygen flow meter, and you can see the liter flow. We got one, two, three, four, five, then goes up to like 10 and 15 or flush, okay? But there's a certain range we can use for nasal cannulas, okay? For nasal cannula, the flow range can be generally up to six liters per minute. All right, up to six liters per minute.
flows greater than six do not significantly increase the FiO2 due to the field anatomic reservoir. Okay, remember we talked about the reservoirs yesterday. So if you didn't, uh, wasn't here yesterday, you'll have to look when it, when it loads. But the uh, anatomic reservoir, remember, is that space inside of the nose, right? As the nasal cannula goes into the patient's nose, right? The oxygen spreads into his nasal and oropharyngeal space, right? Oropharynx, nasal and oropharynx back here. That's a reservoir. It's holding that oxygen in between breaths, all right? But if you do a past six liters, it's just not even feeling, doesn't have time to feel, so it, it doesn't get any better with FiO2, okay? So the flow ranges for a nasal cannula are flows up to six, so one to six liters, or sometimes you'll see them on half a liter. Because we said yesterday, you only want to use just enough oxygen to treat hypoxemia, okay? If they're hypoxemic, you want to use as little oxygen as possible to overcome the hypoxemia, okay? Sometimes nasal cannula is enough for most people, but sometimes it's not. You go up when you have to, but you don't just jump right in with a non-rebreather for somebody who has a little low sac, okay? Start low. All right. <clears throat> FiO2. Remember I said in a low flow device, you cannot guarantee the FiO2. However, you can estimate about what they're getting if they have a normal ventilatory pattern, right? Low flow devices depend greatly on the respiratory pattern of the patient, all right? As long as they're breathing under 25 times a minute, Tidal volume around 25, uh, less than 25, I'm sorry, respiratory rate less than 25, tidal volume between 300 and 700 mLs, right? <clears throat> and they're breathing normal and consistent. They're not gasping, they're not uh, breathing one time every minute, right? That's barely breathing, that won't work. It has to be normal, okay? Normal and consistent, the same, all right? Now, if they are breathing that way, then we can estimate what they're, FiO2 is going to be by what's called the rule of fours. The rule of fours. Okay. Now, technically, oxygen in the atmosphere is 20.95%. We round it up to 21%, right? So 20.95%. So what they're saying is if I give them one liter of oxygen through this flow meter, they should get about 24% FiO2 because that's adding four, right? 20.95 and then add four as 24, okay? If I put them on two liters, they should be getting about 28% FiO2. If I turn it up to three liters, that should be about 32% FiO2. What about four liters? How much should they get at four liters? 36% FiO2. What about five liters? 40%. FiO2 and at six liters about 44. So you notice how it goes up by four. That's called the rule of fours. That's how we estimate the amount of oxygen on the nasal cannula, right? Only on the nasal cannula. All right. Now, a lot of studies say, you know, well, what if he's breathing through his mouth? What if he's snoring at night, right? Well, a, a lot of people have thought about that and said, well, if it's in his nose and he's breathing through his mouth, what, I mean, is he not getting any oxygen? Well, most studies indicate mouth breathing does not significantly affect the oxygen delivery. It's still going up in there. So when he breathes in, he's still sucking, it's still pulling on the oxygen, okay? Now, uh, if he's breathing, if you see his sats going down, you can put a mask on, okay? If he's breathing at night and he's totally out of his mouth, then you can put a mask on, right? We can do whatever we got to do. All right, all right. All right, the next low flow device is called a nasal catheter. Now we don't have any of those here, but a nasal catheter is uh, similar to the similar FIO2s to the nasal cannula. It's inserted using a water soluble lubricant just above the oral pharynx. So what you do is it's one tubing, right? The, uh, 
nasal catheter would be something like this. It'd just be one long, small bore tubing with a tip with some holes on the end of it, okay? And what they do is they will put KY jelly on it and stick it into patient's nose. Same jelly they use for, um, for any kind of insertions uh, in the hospital, right? Because it's very dry, that plastic will tear the mucosa. So we use KY jelly and it will lubricate the end of it and they will stick it in the nose and it will go down. You will open the patient's mouth and everybody knows what the uvula is? Where's your, your uvula? Anybody know what, what is the uvula in your mouth? What is that? Huh? Not your tonsil. The uvula. That's that little piece of meat that's in the back of your throat that you see hanging every time you open your mouth. That piece, the piece of meat that's hanging in your in the back of your throat. Yeah, okay. That's your uvula. So you would insert that catheter until you see the tip come past the uvula. All right. Once you see it visible below the uvula, you'll pull it back just a little bit and let it sit there. Tape it on the face, and that will be their oxygen. We don't use that hardly ever anymore, okay? But that's a nasal catheter, right? It must be changed every eight hours and rotating the nares. So if you got it in the left nair for eight hours, you got to take it out and put it in the right nair for eight hours so it doesn't <clears throat> damage or irritate the nair, okay? That's called a nasal catheter, catheter. Rarely used. All right. So that's a, that's another low flow device. So if you see um, <clears throat> the ones I showed you, the ones that we have here, but the nasal catheter is also a low flow device. So if you see a test question, say which one of these are low flow devices, and they list them all, you need to make sure your nasal catheter is one of your choices because it is a low flow device. That's what we're talking about right now. <clears throat> Simple O2 mask. Now, with a simple O2 mask, we can get FIO2s, we estimate about 35 to 55%, depending on some things, right? It can give you moderate concentration. 35 to 55% is pretty good, okay? That's pretty moderate. But again, what's B say? Thank you. It depends on the ventilatory pattern. I'm going to say that 100 times when we're talking about low flow devices. It totally is dependent on or contingent on the patient's ventilatory pattern. So what are the leader flows for the, for the simple face mask? Five to eight, okay? Now, when I'm using a simple face mask, I must have flows at least five. It's five to eight liters per minute on the, on the, nas on the flow meter. I gotta turn it up to five to eight, okay? It has to be at least five because if I have it less than five, then what's going to build up in the mask? CO2, carbon dioxide. So you must have, you must have liter flows at least five liters per minute on a simple O2 mask, right? because anything less than five will allow CO2 to start to build up, okay? You don't want that because this is, mask itself is also a reservoir, remember? We said we have anatomic reservoir, which is the nasal and oral pharyn uh, pharyngeal space or pharynx. Then you have, <coughs> you have your um, mask itself. This will be a little reservoir in between breaths is collecting. And then that bag on the end of the mask, if you have a bag on your mask, that's also a reservoir. So you have anatomical here, and then you have mechanical reservoirs on the actual device. So you have to be careful. You can't go in and say, well, he's on two liters oxygen, uh, but he, won't, he don't like it in his nose. So I'm gonna put this mask on him and put it on for two liters. That's not gonna work. You have to crank it up to at least five. All right, <clears throat> it's less comfortable than a cannula, because a lot of people don't like stuff on their face, okay? A lot of people get claustrophobic and can't stand a mask on their face, but you know, now with coronavirus, you're having to get used to having a mask on your face, but it's less comfortable, okay? Uh, and at six liters, uh, let's see, at six liters, it will deliver a higher FIO2 than a nasal cannula would have, because it has more reservoir, okay? It has this mask. This is also catching some of the oxygen in between breaths, okay? 
talked about that yesterday. <clears throat> you have to have, you have to understand that in between breaths, the oxygen is still flowing. So when you're not breathing, it's collecting either in the back of your own space or in the mask itself. And so since this has an extra reservoir space being the mask itself, uh, it gives a little bit better FiO2 at six liters than a nasal cannula would, okay? But not only that, you wouldn't want to go to six liters on a nasal cannula because you would make their nose bleed. It's so dry, okay? So be very careful. Five to eight liters for the simple O2 mask. Five to eight liters. Must be at least five to prevent CO2 buildup. Then we go into the partial rebreather mask. Partial rebreather mask, that's the partial rebreather. It does not have flaps, right? It does not have those little one-way valves on it. it. does not have it. It's a mask with no valves and a reservoir bag. That is the partial rebreather. Now, we can get FIO2s up to about 60% with the partial rebreather. Depending again on what? Ventilatory pattern. What is the flow range for the partial rebreather mask? Eight to 10 liters. All right, now, discussing the, the flow on the partial rebreather and the non rebreather, we have this bag must stay inflated. Okay? It must stay inflated. If you have this running, the bag will be inflated. Okay, you have to have enough flow to keep it inflated. If Mr. Johnson breathes in and it collapses the bag, you don't have enough flow. You must increase the flow. Okay, so if, even if it's on 10 and he breathes in and it collapses, I would do whatever I got to do to make it even more so it stays open when he inhales. Okay, when he inhales, it should stay open. It should not collapse. Okay. So the flow range for a non-rebreather and a partial rebreather are both eight to 10 liters. Make sure you write that down. They're both eight to 10 liters and you must have enough flow to keep the bag inflated. All right, number three says no valve. We said that it has no valve between the mask and the mag. Dang, I said that totally backwards, didn't I? I said the mask and the, well, I, is no valve between the bag and the mask. Okay, no valve. Now, the reason why it's called a partial rebreather is because the first one third of exhaled gas that you exhale goes into the bag from your anatomical dead space. Therefore, similar to the inspired gas. Okay, so the first one third, the first one third of the gas goes into the bag, right? So when you inhale, you're going to get that one third right back. So that's why you're partially rebreathing your own gas, okay? Because there's no valve. There's no valve to keep to make your exhale go out completely and not in, right? For the partial rebreather, not to be used at low flow rates because you'll increase again the CO2. Got to be eight to ten for the partial rebreather. And to the non rebreather, which is pretty much the same as the partial rebreather, except it has those flaps. And because it has those one way flaps, you can get FIO2 from 70 to 100% as possible. Notice how they put 100% is one, right? It's not 0.1. 100% is not 0.1, it is one. 0.1 is 10%. Okay, so we can do 70% up to 100%. It's possible, again, depending on the ventilatory pattern. non rebreathers, you have to have flows from 8 to 10 liters, again, just like the partial rebreather. Must be adequate flow to keep the bag from collapsing on inspiration. It has the one-way valve in it, like we discussed earlier in the lecture. It has these one-way valves. So it has one on this side, and it has one on this side. Okay, it also has one right down the middle between the bag and the actual mask. It has another flap there, okay? And that flap keeps you from breathing into the bag and only out. So when you exhale, it comes out of the bag and when you inhale, these valves shut 
and this one will open and you get pure oxygen, okay? That is what we're trying to do, okay? That's the... Gabrielle trying to get in, but I keep going in and out. All right. <clears throat> so look at number four. It has two one-way valves on the exhalation ports, right? It has these two one-way valves on, these are called exhalation ports, you know, so that place you can exhale that CO2. But we usually take one off for safety, okay? So when you buy them and the respiratory therapist department pulls them out the bag or whatever, before you give it to a patient, you usually pull one off, okay? You usually pull one off for safety because if they're closed and that comes disconnected from your source, your gas source, then when they exhale, they can exhale, but they can't inhale because the bag is going to be collapsed, flaps are closed, and now he's suffocating trying to inhale. You're not paying attention because you're doing something else, and he's suffocating. So we take one that way. If something happened, he can at least be getting some air in that one side until we figure it out, okay? Until we can figure out something's wrong. That is the non-rebreather mask. The last one is a transtracheal catheter, which whoa, we really, really don't ever see these anymore, okay? But this is another one, transtracheal catheter. That is a catheter that's inserted directly into the trachea. So look at this mannequin here, or this diagram here. This is his nose and mouth, or this is his trach, right? And he will usually have a tracheostomy in there, right? This is the tracheostomy, all right? This is a tracheostomy, all right? That we will put directly into a patient's trachea, all right? And it goes directly into the airway. And if we're going to be putting positive pressure, trying to force some air in, I have to blow this balloon up. If I don't, then I'm, it's gonna come right out of his mouth. If I force, force volume in and this is not inflated, then the air is just going to come out his nose, right? His mouth is not going to go straight to the lungs. So whenever we have somebody intubated or trached for a ventilator and we're forcing air into the lungs, breathing for them, we have to inflate this little balloon and it will seal up the airway. That way, when we give pressure or we give volume, it goes directly to the lungs, okay? So if he doesn't have this yet, right? Not quite there yet. We may have a transtracheal catheter, which will simply be another small bore tubing looking device that will just go straight into his trachea okay and they will tape it up and that would give oxygen right directly into the trachea now you can imagine using a transtracheal catheter you barely have to use any flow right because it's right there at the trach you don't need don't have any air entrainment right it's not like nares or mouth or sucking in outside air right it's way down at the trachea right way down about right in here, right? That's where your corona is. So it's right down in here. <clears throat> and it's just so you can use about 0.25 liters. 0.25, not even a half a liter will be significant or sufficient, right? <clears throat> but it's so dangerous because it's, you know, you and when anytime you intersect or inter interject anything into the trachea, it has to be a sterile procedure, okay? It has to be completely sterile. If you suction a patient's trachea, like that picture I showed you guys, I sent sent the nasty picture of that trach. You got that? If I when I go and suck that trach out, I have to use a special catheter and with special gloves that are in the catheter box, right? The package. I open up the package, have to don on sterile gloves, and only have a sterile hand and a bad hand, and gotta know which one it is because when you pull that catheter out, it can only go straight into the trach. Can't touch anything. It has to be sterile. So that's a lot of work trying to do that. We're just gonna put the trach here. Uh, put a tracheostomy in them and use a high flow device. Okay, <clears throat> so that's why you don't see trans tracheal catheters anymore. Okay, just secretions, nasty secretions. That's what you're going to deal with coming out, pouring out, smelling real foul, like dead body, and it's coughing, it's splash all on his chest. You got to clean it up. It could be all on your arm when you're dealing with trays. It's nasty, right? And she's got to be that's what you're getting signed up for. <clears throat> We put the trachea, we put, we, we put the, not initially, the surgical procedure is done by the physician, but at certain, like my facility, when it's, when it's time to change one out, we change them out. We put something in to hold its place, pull it out, put a new one in. It's a sterile procedure, 
down, all that stuff on, and downsize, decaying, like we do everything to the trach except for the initial cutting. We don't do that. The doctor so does that. Doctor no. Okay. That's respiratory. That's respiratory. All right. Now we're going to take a break. It is 140. Let's take a break to 150, and we're going to come back and talk about high flow systems. Before I do that, make sure you understand transtracheal catheter was a Teflon catheter inserted directly into the trachea. The anatomic reservoir now includes part of the trachea, so less oxygen flow is needed to maintain adequate oxygenation. So now we can use not even one liter, not even a half a liter. We can just turn the flow meter on 0.25 right and that will oxygenate them pretty good but again it has to be sterile uh it's a lot of big risk for infection so it's barely ever used so all of the high flow devices i mean low flow devices what are the low flow devices before we go to break nasal cannula nasal catheter simple face mask partial rebreather non-rebreather and transtracheal catheter those are the low flow devices that we have in respiratory therapy. All of those, don't leave them out. When you get that multiple, multiple question and you leave out transtracheal catheter because you didn't hear it or you didn't study it or read that, it is one of them, okay? All right, so now we're going to take that break, come back to high flow systems. We're gonna talk about the magic box, the magic box to tell us how do we find total flow? How do I know how much flow is coming out of this system, okay? How do I know how much flow? And so when we come back, uh, I'm gonna get that oxygen cylinder probably and just bring it in here so I can write on this board, all right? Total flow, high flow systems when we come back. All right, guys, we're back. We're back now, we're gonna continue on with high flow systems. All right, high flow systems is a little more involved. All right, it's more than just selecting which one and putting them on them, right? Or remembering the leader flows. High flow systems are, it's a lot of them and they have a total flow, right? They have a total flow. So with high flow systems, Remember we said low flow systems depend on the patient's ventilatory demand, right? Well, a high flow system could care less about your ventilatory demand. It will guarantee a FIO2 and it will, it will provide all of the patient's demands. I don't care if you're breathing a thousand times a minute. A high flow system will satisfy his hunger for air, okay? All high flow systems satisfy patient's demands, okay? So then you have to say, well, Mr. McCarthy, how do I know what the patient's demand is, right? Well, Rayana will tell us how to find the patient's ventilatory demand, okay? Remember that, Rayana? How do we find Mr. Johnson's demand? Remember, three times the what? Is it the pounds? No, the minute ventilation, remember that? Three times the patient's minute ventilation will give us his demand. Okay, what he's demanding, right? And then we have to put him on a high flow system that will meet that demand, okay? And the only way we can know if our system is meeting that demand is using what's called the magic box, okay? So I'm gonna show you the magic box now. All All right, so now we're talking about high flow. System, high flow system. 
first have to meet the patient's demand. Okay? Meet the patient's demand and you have to know the patient's demand by three times the minute ventilation equals demand. Our flow system will meet all patients' demand. I'll meet all the patients' demand. Okay. What is the patient's demand? Patient's demand is three times the minute ventilation. That is his demand. Okay. Remember, this was sidebar, minute ventilation equals frequency times what? Tidal volume. That's minute ventilation. All right, so for example, Uh, Mr. Smith has a frequency of 32 breaths per minute, right? Frequency and respiratory rate, the same thing. Frequency or respiratory rate mean the same thing, right? All right? So Mr. Smith has a frequency of 32 breaths per minute, and he has, uh, let's just say he, he weighs 85 kilograms, all right? First thing I want to know, what is his minute ventilation? And the next thing, what? is his demand. Calculator. First thing I want to know, what is his minute ventilation? And then, what is his demand? Minute ventilation is frequency times tidal volume. So you gotta remember how to get his tidal volume from this weight. How do I find this tidal volume? What's the formula for tidal volume? Not three times gas space. Is it kilograms times 2.2? Well, that will give us his pounds. How do I find this tidal? What's the formula for tidal volume? Tidal volume is three times per pound. So three cc's per pound. Three cc's per pound. That's tidal volume. See how you have to remember these formulas? Going on forward, you can't forget about this. You got to know that to find his tidal volume is three times his pounds. So first we got to find out how many pounds does he weigh. What you say? 187? So, okay, so Judith said he weighs 187 pounds. Okay, so 85 times 2.2, like you said, Rihanna, equals 187. So he weighs 187 pounds. So three times 187 
is what? 561. 561. So his tidal volume is 561 milliliters. Okay? Gotta remember how to do those. So knowing his minute I mean knowing his poundage now, his tidal volume and his rate, what is his minute ventilation and what is his demand? Seventeen nine five two. Yeah. Uh, what did you say? Yeah, she, Rayana said seventeen point nine. Okay. okay. What you say? Seventeen point nine. You got that too? Okay. Good. His so his minute ventilation is seventeen point nine uh, liters, right? Because you did. 0.561 times 32, and that gave you, so that was the minute ventilation, gave you 17.9, or if you said 18, that's fine. 17.9 liters. That's his minute ventilation. So what is his uh, demand? 53.8. All right, so his minute ventilation is 17.9. So to find demand is three times that. So three times 17.9 gave us what? 50 what? So 53.8 liters per minute is his demand. That's his demand. Okay? So will a nasal cannula going at two liters per minute be a, so will that meet or exceed his demand? Look up here. If he needs 53.8 liters and you got him on a two liter nasal cannula, will that meet his demand? No, nowhere close, right? What about uh, a non rebreather or partial breather running at eight to 10 liters per minute? Will that meet that? No. So that means we have to move on to a high flow device. Okay, we got to move on to a high flow device. So let's find out how to find total flow, okay? So on the next star down here will be uh, find total flow. So to, to find the total flow, we have to use what's called the magic box. All right. Find the total flow. You have to find use the magic box. All right, the magic box. All right, first let me show you one of the high flow devices. This is a large volume nebulizer, right? Large volume nebulizer that uses the Venturi principle, okay? It uses the Venturi principle. What did we say about yesterday? Well, I don't know if you were here yesterday, wasn't you? When I say the patient fart in the car and the windows are up, the concentration of the fart is very strong. But when I let the windows down, I entrain outside air, right? And it brings the concentration of the smell down, right? Same thing with oxygen. If this is hooked up to my oxygen flow meter, which is hooked up like this, it's just, just screw it on. Okay, screw it on like that, just like that, okay? This will be hooked up to the wall, and this will be your flow meter here, okay? Well, you're going to pass this around and show you guys first. You see these numbers on here? These are the FIO2s, and this turns, this window turns, opens up or can close, right? And it has, I don't know if you can see it, but it has a little white arrow right there. Can y'all see that little white arrow? Okay, let me put some, put some color on it. Now, can you see it? See that white arrow? Well, see, it's pointing to the FIO2s. Look at that. That's 98%, right? 
right? So if I want 98% oxygen, what are the windows? See the windows? The windows are closed, right? Pretty much all the way closed. So that means pure oxygen coming from here would not pull in any outside air, so it's gonna give me a high FiO2 because it's not pulling any outside air that will bleed it down, right? But if what if I want 28%? So let me turn this to 28%. See that 28%? Look at the windows, wide open, right? So since the windows are wide open, outside air is flowing in through here and bleeding down this percentage of FiO2, right? So now 100% oxygen is coming out of here, but when it sucks in outside air, it makes the concentration go down. It's like putting more water on the Kool-Aid, right? The more, window, the more open the windows are, the more outside air or the more water you're putting on your Kool-Aid, okay? So with that, we have to decide how much flow is actually coming to the patient because it's pulling in all this outside air. So we gotta figure out, well, how do we know how much flow is he getting? And is that flow going to meet his demand, okay? This is how you do it. Magic box. All right, we have a box. All right, in the middle goes the FiO2, and you put 20 right here, 100 right here. Now, I'm going to put this on an FiO2, and you're going to tell me what am I putting it on, all right? What FiO2 is that on? 60%, you see that? 60%, okay? So I wanna know if I turn the flow meter up to, let's just say 10 liters per minute. I turn my flow meter on 10 liters per minute and I'm giving him 60%. What is the total flow coming out? You have to use the magic box, okay? So let's just say for instance, patient is on a aerosol, face mask at, you said 60%, running at 10 liters per minute. All right, I'm gonna explain what aerosol face mask means in a minute. But just know, high flow devices, what is this inside of here? No, what's this you see inside of here? Water, right? So when it is on, it's gonna produce an aerosol. Okay, it's gonna produce an aerosol. And I'm gonna hook it up to the tank and let you see the aerosol and all that, okay? Uh, also, that's in the lab that's already in this module that I told you guys, you can look at those labs from the last time I did a lab and it shows, like I'm hooking it up, explaining it, letting you see it. So utilize that, all right? So this is water inside of here. It's going to produce what we call an aerosol. Aerosol you can see, humidity you can't see, okay? Remember that, all right. So it's gonna produce an aerosol. And so whatever we put at the end of it is what it's called. Aerosol face mask, aerosol tray color, aerosol tea piece, aerosol face tint, right? Whatever I have at the end of it is what it's called. But it's gonna say aerosol first because it's coming from the water source, okay? All right, and after we take another break, I'll go set everything up. First, I wanna go over this magic box and some of the notes, and then we'll uh, get, get this stuff and set it up. All right, so magic box. I wanna find out the total flow that's coming from this aerosol face mask that I have at 60% running at 10 liters per minute. What is the total flow, okay? So what I have to do is figure it out. So what is the FiO2 in this problem? No, no, you do, you do 60, you put the whole 60. So it's 60, so I put 60 right here. Now, 100 minus 60 is what? 40, and 60 minus 20 is what? Huh? 40. 40 divided by 40 is what? 
one. All right, now the magic box is going to give us our air to oxygen ratio. That's what the magic box is going to give us. It's about to give us our air to oxygen ratio. Okay? Remember this. Oxygen is always one, which is the second side, okay? So the first side when we do the division is the oxygen, I mean the air. This is the air, and this side will be the O2, okay? Just so happens that 60% is 40 over 40, which is one, right? 40 divided by 40 is what? One. So one part air and one part oxygen. The oxygen is always one part. So the second number is always one, always. So whatever the air is, if it's two to one, three to one, five to one, it's something to one, okay? It's always gonna be something to one, right? So the magic box gives us our air to oxygen, Ratio. That's what the magic box is going to give us. We need to know what the air to oxygen ratio is. How many parts air, how many parts oxygen. See that? That's what we're trying to figure out. In that fart in the car, how much part fart, how much part air, right? That's what we're trying to find out. How much part, what part, how many parts are air, how many parts are oxygen in this situation, okay, in this device. All right, now, so first thing you do is find the, let's see, number one. Number one is get the, find air to O2 ratio, right? Number two thing to do is find the total parts. And then number three is find total flow. This is the steps right here. To find the air oxygen ratio, you do the magic box. I'll put over here magic box. To find the total parts, you add both parts. And then to find the total flow, you multiply total parts times the liters per minute that you got it set on. And that will give you your total flow. All right, so first thing we did was find the air to oxygen ratio of 60%. The air to oxygen ratio to 60% is always gonna be one to one. That's Now you have a list of these in your book. It's got all the FO2s and what their ratios are, okay? You can either memorize the book or you can learn this magic box, okay? But they're in your book. If you're reading, you would have seen this. All right, now, <clears throat> so 60% FO2, that's what this is. You do 100 minus 60 is 40, and 60 minus 20 is 40, okay? 40 divided by 40 is 1 to 1, okay? You're going, 40 divided by 40 is 1, that's the air, and oxygen is always what? 1, so it's a 1 to 1. So 1 part air, 1 part oxygen. Number 2, find the total parts by adding both parts. So what's, how many parts total? 2. See that, Judah? Look right here. Number two says find the total parts. Well, we already have one part air, one part oxygen. So if I add them two together, it's what? Two. So we have two total parts, okay? Number three says find the total flow. To find the total flow, you add, I mean, you do total parts times 
the liters per minute in the problem. So total parts of two times how many liters per minute in the problem? 10. So two times 10 is what? 20. So this device we have is has a total flow of 20 liters per minute. Is 20 liters per minute enough to, to, for that other patient's demand that was 56 point something? That ain't enough, is it? Nope. So we're going to have to change the flow. Okay? We're going to have to either increase the flow meter or decrease the oxygen. Because when you decrease the, I mean, when you increase the flow, you want to decrease the oxygen. When you increase the oxygen, you want to decrease the flow because of air entrainment, right? So notice when I close the windows, right? When those windows are closed, that's giving me high oxygen, but now I'm not pulling any outside air. So my total flow is going to go down, right? I let the window up. When I let the window up, now it's barely any air moving, right? Pl plenty fart, but no air, right? But if I decrease the FIO2, right? Now look at that. I open those windows up. I have a lower FIO2 of oxygen, but I have a more higher flow, total flow, because I'm sucking in a lot of outside air. So that increased my flow. So again, in the lecture from yesterday, it talks about how if you increase the FIO2, you're going to decrease the total flow. Okay? That's the only way you can do it. All right? Because of the air entrainment system. Okay? So... 20 liters per minute is the total flow of this device. Not going to meet his demand. Okay? Now, what if I do this? What if I change his FIO2 and his liter flow? Keep him on the same system. We we'll say, okay, Mr. Johnson, I'm going to have to give you 28% at 15 liters per minute. Let's see if that meets his demand. Now, let's just say his demand, because I have his demand, let's see, demand was what? 50, let's just say 56 liters per minute. That was his demand, right? This is what we're trying to fix. We're trying to see if we can get to there. All right, so now, do your magic box now. Follow the steps. Follow the steps to find the total flow of a device that's an aerosol face mask at 28% FIO2 and running at 15 liters per minute. Let's see what his total flow is now. Whichever one makes sense. You just do like you've been doing. Nothing changes. Whatever you get, that's what you get. Even if it's a decimal. Around you said 150, 150 liters. Okay, let's see. All right, let's do it together. Number one, we have an aerosol face mask running at 28%, going at 15 liters per minute. All right. So we have our high flow system set at 28%, right? Windows are wide open, and we have the flow meter turned up to 15 liters. Got the ball way up here, okay? We rolling now, okay? Let's see now. What goes right here? Rayana, Rayana what goes right here? Did she put the answer on? What's the F out to, Rayana? 28. 28. So 100 minus 28 is what? 
72. 28 minus 20 is what? Eight. Eight. So 72 divided by eight is what? Nine. Nine. So nine parts air and how many oxygen? One. one. Always one. Right? Number two. Judith, find the total parts. So what are my total parts in this in this problem? Ten. So I have total parts is ten, right? Let's do total flow over here. So total parts is nine plus one is ten. Number three, uh, Miss Shepherd, find the total flow. Total parts times liters per minute. So ten times fifteen is what? 150, 150 liters, good Rayon. So his, the total flow of this device is now 150 liters per minute. See how it went up? See how you went down on the FIO2 and the flow went up, right? So his, he's only demanding 56 and we're providing 150. So are we meeting his demand? Yes. Your goal is to meet or exceed his demand. Are we meeting or exceeding his demand? Yes. So he's good. Okay. Now, you know, some people will say, well, what about you went down on his oxygen? What if he needed that oxygen, right? True. If he needs that oxygen, I would have to have two set up with another oxygen source coming in. Okay. It's called a tandem. But a lot of times people just need the hunger for the flow. Most times it's not that they need the oxygen per se, but they need the what? Flow. So say you're in the car, right? What's the FIO2 inside your car as you with the windows up? What's the FIO2 in your car? 21%. But if you feel short of breath, what's the first thing you're gonna do? Not the air. Huh? I'm just saying, if you're in the car and the windows are up and you start feeling short of breath, you're gonna do what? Roll them down. Roll your window down, right? Because now it's got more flow coming in the car. But what's the percentage outside? 21. So have you increased the FL2? No, but you satisfied your hunger for flow. Okay? So it ain't always, excuse me for saying ain't, it's not always the oxygen that they need. Sometimes they are hungry for the flow. Okay? And if your patient is demanding 56 liters of flow, then you need to be giving him whatever he needs, okay? And a high flow system is what will accomplish that, okay? The high flow system will meet or exceed all of the patient's demands. We can work this to where it's gonna meet it, okay? And that's on the respiratory therapist to say, okay, well, his, he demands this and we only giving him this, that's why he not, that's why he's short of breath, that's why he's panicking, because he needs air. Stick your head out the window if you need to, right? It's still the same 21%, but it's more flow, okay? That's how you find the total flow of any high flow device, okay? All right, at this time, we're gonna do one more, and then we're gonna take a 20 minute break while I go get the tank and pieces so you can see how it's set up from start to finish, okay? All right, matter of fact, this is what I'm gonna do. We're going to take the, uh, do one more, and then I'm going to roll this into the lab and show you in the lab, okay, after the break. So one more problem right here. Let's find, tell me the total flow of this device. So we're going to start from the whole get go, okay? I'm going to give you the parameters of the patient and then tell you what he he's on, and I want to know, is he meeting, are we meeting or exceeding his demand, okay? We're going to start from the fresh. Mr. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Now, this magic box is in your module. It's a, a sheet that's in your module. So you can always look at that if you need to. What I'm doing is in your module. All right. This is the demand here, so don't forget. Uh, I'll write it again. Demand equals 
Manipulation times three. Okay. All right. So here's the scenario. Mr. Johnson has a respiratory rate of 22, and he weighs 120 pounds. Uh, that's good enough. Number one, what is his minute ventilation? Number two, what is his demand? All right. And then number three is, are you meeting demand? Yes or no? And this is what he's on up here. He is on a aerosol face mask, it's AF, AFM, of 30% running at 12 liters per minute. That is what you have him on. You got him hooked up to an aerosol face mask at 30 liters per minute. Okay. This is what you have him on. This is his parameters over here. Respiratory rate of 22, he weighs 120 pounds. I need you to tell me his minute ventilation, his demand, and are you meeting his demand if he's on this? Okay, so do one thing at a time. First thing is to find his demand, okay? And then find the total flow. And you just look at him and say, okay, am I meeting or I'm not? Work on that. Mr. McCarthy, is that 30% or 80%? All right. Yes, the FO2 is 30%. If you can't see it, it's 30%.
colors in. They got different colors. Yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Okay, for sure. All right, so let's check it out. First thing we're gonna do is find out what is the patient's demand. So let's do one thing at a time. I know you're excited and you got all your answers. Let's do one thing at a time. All right, Judith, what is his minute ventilation? Good, 7.92 liters. That's his minute ventilation. If that's his minute ventilation, uh, Brianna, what is his demand? You with me, Rayana? Yeah, I'm here. What's his demand? Uh, 23.7. 23.7, excellent. 23.7 liters. That's his demand. Okay. Um, I got a question. What? Um, I keep getting the 7.92 for the demand. Well, minute ventilation is 7.92 because minute ventilation is frequency times tidal volume. Well, he's breathing 20 time, 22 times a minute, and his tidal volume is three times this 120, right? Right. So you need three times 120 to get tidal volume, and then multiply that by 22, and you get 7.92. Okay. Okay, so his, he weighs 120 pounds. So what's that tidal volume? So 120 times three is 360. His tidal volume would be 360. So then you do 0.360 times his respiratory rate or frequency of 22. Okay, see, I was doing 120 times 22. That's his pounds. Minute ventilation is, minute ventilation is frequency times tidal volume. And how do you get tidal volume? Tidal volume is three times the pounds, right? It's three cc's per pound, right? So tidal volume equals three cc's per pound. That's the formula for tidal volume. Okay. Okay, so you have to first find this tidal volume. Well, I gave you pounds this time, so it's 120 times three, and that's 360. So then you okay, do- Okay, I think I was doing extra steps somewhere. All right, so his demand is 23.7 liters. All right, Gabrielle, what do we put inside the box, Gabrielle? You with me, Miss Gabrielle? All right, Miss Shepard, what do I put in the box? Because now we know the patient's demand is 23.7. Now we got to find out, are we meeting and exceeding that demand? So we got to work out the magic box to find the air to oxygen ratio and total flow. Okay, so first things first, what is the FIO2, Miss Shepard? 30. 30 right there. So 100 minus 30 is what, Miss Shepard? 70. And then 30 minus 20 is 10. So 70 divided by 10 is what? Seven. seven. So seven parts air to what part oxygen? One. All right. Judith, what is the total parts? Eight. So we have total parts is eight, right? So with the total parts being eight, what is the total flow? Anybody? Good. Eight times 12. Right? Total flow is total parts, which is eight times the liters per minute, which is 12, is what you say? Total flow is 96 liters per minute. All right? So his total flow is 96 liters per minute. His demand is only 23. So are we meeting his demand? Yes. The answer is yes. Got it? That's it. That's how you do it, okay? First, you got to find out the patient's demand, and then you see what you have set up, and are you meeting that demand, okay? If you're not meeting that demand, you're going to have to probably either go up on your flow 
or go down on the FIO2, okay? And then work it out again to see if you are meeting his demand. All right, it is now 2.35. Come back at three o'clock. We'll just do three o'clock straight up and down. It's like 25 minutes. Take a break till three o'clock. I'm gonna go over to the lab and set up a few things. And then I'm gonna pause recording right here. And I'm gonna go to the lab while you take your break, come back and show you the high flow devices in action, showing you the mist and the aerosol that you see, how to distinguish that aerosol face mask, aerosol T piece, aerosol, right? All those things. What are you saying, Rayon? You gotta go? I'm saying that I'm gonna log back in at like 3.30. Okay. Okay. No problem. All right, so I'm gonna pause the recording here while you guys take a break. Come back at 3 p.m. and we will be in the lab going over these high flow devices. All right, guys, we're back and we are in the lab. Uh, so at this point, we are going to go over some of those high flow devices that we talked about. Those high flow devices that we talked about, uh, how to understand which one is which and we just talked about the total flow, how to find total flow, how to find the patient's demand. So you'll need to go back and look at that as several times as you need to, rewind it, whatever you need to do in the lecture to, uh, to get that point across, okay? Make sure you understand that. Now, uh, to start out, you first have to start out with your aerosol device, right? Now, over in the class, I showed you guys this aerosol device, right? This is a large volume nebulizer that utilizes the two principles. One is the Bernoulli principle. Bernoulli uh, is a scientist who talked about uh, flow or fluid through a small orifice, right? This is the Bernoulli principle here. And the second principle is the Venturi principle, which is air entrainment that we talked about, right? And that's these windows here. As you close them off, you have higher percentage of FiO2. As you open them up, you have lower FiO2s because of air entrainment, all right? So high flow devices or aerosol something, right? Aerosol face mask, aerosol T-piece, aerosol trait collar, aerosol face tint, right? Those are all start with a basic large volume nebulizer that goes on to the wall outlet, okay? Now, sometimes they look different, but they do the same. Now, just for case understanding that, you remember green is oxygen, yellow is room air. For some reason, the company made these for yellow. This does not go on room air, okay? If you have this hooked up to your air flow meter, it's only going to be 21% oxygen no matter what, okay? So you only put these on oxygen. I don't know why they made them yellow. Okay? That was real stupid, but they did, all right? So they may look like this. They may look like this. They could even look like this one, okay? Same principle, right? Venturi, air and training. You can close those windows or open them up. All right, see that? All right, so we're gonna use just one here for demonstration. So the first thing you do is set up your aerosol device, which is your large volume nebulizer. Goes onto your oxygen flow meter. It screws on like this. Okay? You would then turn on your flow meter to whatever you set, okay? On the other side, we had a couple of different aerosol face masks at 12 liters, 15 liters, 10 liters, whatever. But whatever you set, that's how you set it. Notice that the ball will rise to whatever flow meter you want, whatever uh, liters per minute you want. Right now, I have to set the ball at 10, okay? So I'll show you. All right? This is set at 10. See the ball goes down. 
five, four, three, two, and one liter, okay? Or I can go all the way up to flush. Now, no matter how flush I get it, because it's air entrainment, it won't go up any higher with this on this device. All right, so we have to just kind of say what we're on, okay? Notice the, the aerosol. Aerosol you can see, humidity you cannot see. All right, all right. So the pieces that are required for your high flow devices would be your large volume flow uh, nebulizer. Your large volume nebulizer and you have to have large bore tubing, okay? On the low flow devices, you mainly had small bore tubing, right? This is large bore tubing. So you have to have one large bore tubing that goes right to the actual device. I don't know if you can see it on the video, but you see the mist? Okay, all right. Now, since this is aerosol, which is water particle, right? Eventually, what's going to start collecting in my tube? Water. It's going to start collecting and be water in my tube. So I have to have a uh, device that will catch that water. This is called a water trap or a water bag. Okay, so you have your large bore tubing from your device and then your water bag, okay? Now, from your water bag, now you need another large bore tubing to the patient, okay? So here's your second large bore tubing, right here. Did you miss? This is your setup. This is your high flow setup, your aerosol, whatever. Whatever goes on the end is what you call it, okay? Aerosol face mask will be a face mask right there. Aerosol tray collar will be a tray collar right there. Aerosol T-piece will be a T-piece right here. And aerosol face tent will be a face tent right here. Okay? So I'm going to show you a few more. A few more. This is considered to be a trach collar. This is a trach collar. This will go on a patient's tracheostomy. Okay? This is a trach collar. Okay? It sits on the patient just like that, okay? It will sit on the patient just like that, right? And then you will put, put your oxygen source like that. That is an aerosol what? The name of this whole thing is aerosol, what is this? Trait collar, aerosol trait collar. Whatever is on the end is what you call it, okay? Whatever you put on the end of this is what it's called. This is an aerosol trait collar, all right? This is considered to be an aerosol trait collar, all right? Now, some patients have who have regular airways, right, that don't have a tracheostomy, uh, but say they had oral surgery or major facial fractures in a wreck, a car wreck or something like that, we, would want, we wouldn't want to put a mask on his face. We would put a face tint. Okay, this is an aerosol face, well, this is a face tint, okay? It just sits on you like this, right? Oxygen would just be in this little area and you would just breathe it from right here because that is keeping them from touching their face, right? You're trying to keep from touching their face and, you know, messing up any kind of uh, plastic surgery they might have done, or reconstructive long surgery that they may have gotten done, okay? So in that case, you will use a face tint. Okay, so if I have this on the end of here, this is now called a what? I can hear you. Aerosol face tint. All right. All right. Now, sometimes we use what's called a Briggs adapter. Say Briggs adapter. Briggs, like the, the tire Briggs Stratton. Briggs adapter. That's what this is also known as a T piece. Okay, looks like a little T. This is also this is this is called a Briggs adapter, also known as a T piece. Okay? And for that instance, if we have a patient on a T piece, we would do this. We take this end of here, the aerosol, right? One end goes on here, and then you have to have a one section of six inch four gate tubing on the other end. That is a T piece. Okay? This would go directly on a patient's trach. 
See that? See that? The PPs. Not only can we use it for that patient, but if we have a patient who is intubated, this patient here is intubated. See, this has an ET tube in his mouth that goes through his glottis, right? In between his vocal cords into the airway. This is, and we have people who are intubated will be on a ventilator. When we take them off the ventilator and we want to see if he will live or can, can, can breathe well without being on the ventilator, we'll turn the ventilator off but leave this in. And we will put on what's called the T piece on here. Like that. See that? Okay, this is a T piece. Now, so if he can breathe like this, then we can take the tube out his throat. Okay? If he can, if he can survive or he can uh, uh, manage without the support of the ventilator, then we can consider taking the tube out. Because once you take the tube out and they don't fly, you have to put them back to sleep and intubate them again. Okay? So that's a lot. It's a very very invasive procedure, okay? Very emergent procedure. You don't want to just be, well, let's pull the tube, right? Because if he can't breathe, if he's not able to sustain, he's going to die. And you're going to hurry up, put him back to sleep, and get that tube in there. And if you're good, you can get it. If you're not good or somebody not around to do it, respiratory is not there to do it, then he's going to suffer, okay? So before I pull that tube, I'm going to see if he's going to survive without the support of the ventilator, and I will be using a T-piece, aerosol, Okay, that can go on the ET tube or it can go directly on the trachea. All right, so that's the T piece. And then finally, the easiest one is the aerosol face mask. I don't have another one, but a face mask, the regular aerosol mask looks like this regular little aerosol mask. You've seen these on breathing treatments when patients have them at home or in the hospital, wherever you are. This is just a regular aerosol mask, okay? It doesn't have any, it's got the two holes. It doesn't have those little, little bitty holes. It has two big holes. This is an aerosol mask. That's all it is, okay? But when I hook it up to my system right here, if I hook that up right there, this is now a what? Aerosol face mask. Aerosol face mask. So you see nothing changes from here to here. You have your large volume nebulizer, which has your Venturi set up here. You will turn this to the oxygen that you want, percentage that you want, right? And you have your one large bore tube in to the bag. And then after your reservoir bag, another large bore tube into the patient. And whatever you put on the end of this is what it's called, okay? aerosol whatever it is all right so let's look at it if i have this right here this is a trach mask right so for this patient this is a trach patient it's got a little um button that snaps right i go behind the neck like this and snap it on okay and i can tighten it with the other side right Nice and snug. And I put my device here, my oxygen device here. This is this, now. What is this device called? Aerosol trait collar. Aerosol trait collar. Okay. All right. If the patient has some kind of facial surgery, right, and I was worried about hurting his face, then I can put this around like this. Right? And then put this here, just like that. That's called a aerosol face tent. Tent, like a tent you get in to sleep in. Aerosol face tent. Now, the mask is not touching his face, right? It's not on the bridge of his nose and all on his face. And the oxygen is, is right here. So every time he breathes, he's getting it from right there. Okay? This is an aerosol face tent. All right. Oh, we did that. Okay. So we did face mask, face tent, T piece, and trait collar. Right? That's it. All right. That's the aerosol setup. You see that mist? That's an aerosol, not a humidifier. 
This is an aerosol. Aerosol you can see, humidity you cannot see. Okay, now notice the flow. See that? I have them set at 98%, right? 98 percent. Right, he's on 98% what I got it set up to, right? Okay, now let's watch, watch this when I go. What do you expect to see when I go down to 28%? Huh? Say it louder. You don't think you what? Uh, it's going to be less because it's going to be so much air that you can't see it. It's going to be coming out more. It's coming out faster, right? Because I'm on 98%. So my windows on my, my entrainment are closed, right? It's just pure oxygen coming out of here. But if I open those windows up, it's going to start pulling out outside air, which is called air entrainment, right? Which is going to increase my flow. Remember, if you increase the FiO2, you will decrease the flow. If you in, if you decrease the FiO2, you're going to increase the flow. All right, it's like being in the car. You got that smell in the car. You want to, and it's strong, high percentage of the smell, right? But if you let the windows down, it's going to smell is going to go down because you're pulling in all of that outside air. Okay. So when I go to 28 percent, listen, listen to it also. See how loud that is. That's more flow. You don't even see it now, do you? It's coming out, but it's so fast that you can't see it. You can see it just barely, right? You go up against something dark, sometimes you can see it. See that? Just barely. Barely coming out now. Like I'm saying, it's coming out much faster, but you can barely see it because it's coming out so fast. But you heard how much louder it got, right? Because you got higher flow now. Less FO2, but a higher flow. Okay, I go down at 28%, 35, 40, 60, 80, 98. See how it goes down? So it's barely coming out. That's why you see it real good, because it's barely coming out. So that is our high flow devices. All right? That's how you set up a high flow device. Okay? The high flow devices will meet all of the patients. What? Huh? Demand. High flow devices will meet all of your patients' inspiratory demands. Good job. Okay. Now, let's see what some of the indications are, which we already should know what the indications are, but they're the opposite of the low flow. Opposite of the low flow. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, I don't care. All right, so like we said, high flow systems <clears throat> will meet all of the patient's demands for gas delivered. The total system output must be three times the patient's minute ventilation, and that's called his demand, right? We, uh, the patient's demand is three times his minute ventilation. So if we're going to have a high flow system, our system has to be able to put out at least three times his minute ventilation. So that means we're meeting his demand, right? Uh, <clears throat> this is due to IE, one to two IE ratio. All inspiration occurs during the first one third of the minute. That's not really that important. But what you need to know for sure is our high flow system must be able to meet the patient's demand, right? And his demand is three times the minute ventilation. All right. Those formulas were, were talked about earlier in the in the discussion. So you when you you know you can go back and look at it and study that. Okay. All right. Another good thing about high flow systems is that you're going to have a consistent, predictable, and measurable FiO2. So I can guarantee his FiO2. Okay? I can guarantee FiO2 with a high flow device. Can I guarantee with a low flow device? No. Cannot guarantee the FiO2 on a low flow device. All I can do is estimate. 
and we estimate uh, air file twos with our low flow devices, especially the nasal cannula by using the rule of fours. Also, I gave you the uh, flow ranges for the other low flow devices. You also have about how much air file two they can estimate can give. So make sure you study that. Now, the criteria for a high flow system is any patient who don't meet the criteria for a low flow system. Simple. We said the criteria or indications for the low flow system is what? Respiratory rate less than 25, tidal volume 300 to 700, and a consistent ventilatory pattern, All right? If they don't meet that criteria, you have to put them on a high flow device, okay? Now I showed you the aerosol, all of the aerosol high flow systems, right? All of the aerosol high flow systems I've shown you. But there's another high flow device called the Venturi mask. The Venturi mask itself uh, is a mask that has that Venturi system on it. And here it is. All right. Let me show you some Venturi. See if you see a, uh, there's a mask in there that comes together already. I get it. The Venturi mask, it is also a high flow device, okay? It uses the Venturi principle. So I want you to look right here. The ones in the class, you have one to look in your hand. For those who are online, this is it here. Again, same principle, the windows. So I have to lift it up and turn, right? See how that window's wide open now? It's gonna entrain outside air and make the FO2 go down. If I close the window, now I have a very high FO2, right? Or higher that this can give, okay? Because there's no air coming in or very little air coming in from outside. That is air entrainment. Remember we said anytime you have outside air coming into the system, that's called air entrainment, all right? Notice how <clears throat> it has arrows on here. There's a little arrow right there. See that arrow? Okay, that arrow shows you the FL2 that you're trying to accomplish, right? So right now it's pointing to, that goes up and over to what? 26%, say that's 26%, see that? That little arrow, it goes up and over, up to 26%. So I can go 26%, or I can turn it to 28%, or I can turn it to 31%, see that, right? And those will all be at a flow of three liters per minute. So to turn your flow meter on three, right? The one on the wall, you're turning on three. If you do that and you put this arrow on any one of these, you will get that FL2, right? What if I want one of these FL2s? What if I want 35, 40, or 50% FL2? Well, then I would have to first turn it to what? What liters per minute is that? what liters per minute? Six. I had to turn my flow meter now up to six liters per minute and put my little arrow on one of these, right? One of these right here. Either that one, that one, right? It's real, they're real close together. I don't know why they made them like that, but you just have to kind of open it and turn it, open it and turn it to wherever you want it, right? And doing that will change the FIO2. So this is a Venturi, right? And 
the ones I have on the wall. That's a Ventura, right? The system, the system of air entrainment where the air comes in, that's Venturi. That's a man named, I forgot his first name. His last name is Venturi. He came up with the idea or the science behind air entrainment, okay? So this will be a Venturi mask. This is a Venturi mask, okay? If the doctor says, hey, hand me a Venturi mask, this is what you grab. Now, this is a nice little doodad that was made all together. But as a respiratory therapist, I told you, you have a toolbox, and sometimes we have to make a Venturi ourselves, right? So before I do that, let me talk about the safety system of it. This little piece here, this is the safety system, also known as a, um, you can give medicine through here or whatever, but look how this goes in. This goes in just like that, fits on there just like that, okay? Why do you think this is necessary for protection? Why do you think this should be on here for protection? There's no water in this system. This system, as you said, you see you got the small bore tubing at the bottom. It goes to the wall that there's no water that goes through. This is not an aerosol. This is a Venturi mask. So it's not aerosol, but it's still high flow. Okay. So there's no water. So it's not the water that's gonna that would be a problem. What do you think is the reason for this protection piece right here? Think, huh? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you don't want the patient moving it, but if they're gonna move it, they can take it off and move it. Think about a COPD or why would I need to make sure this is right here? Huh? Make sure it's going in, yeah, but there's something a little bit different. What did we talk about yesterday of, of uh, what uh, about a hazard of oxygen therapy for COPDers? Don't get too much, right? All right, well, how would they get to, what, what, if, what if Mr. Johnson is like this? Look, what if I don't have this on here? What if I don't have this, right? And I got it set at 28%. So, you know, I got the Venturi windows are open. It's pulling in, he getting 28% because high flow device guarantees the FL2, right? But what if I don't have this and I'm doing this? What if I'm in my bed like this and I have cover? The cover is covering up the house, the Venturi window. Now, how much oxygen is he getting? Think about it. Think before you say anything. This is this is oxygen going straight to the wall, coming straight into here, and this is air entrainment, right? Outside air. But if I have this completely closed off, how much oxygen percentage is he getting? No. Oh, what about you, Miss Tabor? He wouldn't be getting none, really. Isn't that covering up where the oxygen comes in it, or this just controlled oxygen? Oh, give me your small bore tube. All right, so you have your small bore. Matter of fact, I think I have one right here. I'm gonna use this. All right, so you got the small bore tube that goes to your Venturi, right? It goes there. It's supposed to go through here, but we're going to just hook it up through here, right? So then the other end is going straight to my oxygen device uh, wall, right? So I'm unplugged it from here. Unplugged it from here. Right? Okay, so I got oxygen here, right? Oxygen coming straight from the wall. What's the percentage of FI2 inside this tube? Coming straight from the oxygen. What, what is it? No, it's the oxygen. 21 is over there, room air. This is pure oxygen. 100%. This is 100% oxygen coming through the tubing, right? Through the tubing. And then when it hits right here, it starts sucking in outside air and bleeds the oxygen down to whatever I have it set to, right? If I have it wide open or if I got it all the way closed, right? So whatever I got it set to. So the more open it is, the more outside air it's pulling in, which makes it bleed down to, uh, let's just say on this one would be 24%. Uh, Cause look, I got it wide open, right? Now look, so this window is wide open, see me, right? So this is 100% oxygen right here coming from the wall. 
But when it gets here, it sucks in outside air, which makes the oxygen concentration go down. So by the time the oxygen concentration comes to you, it is down to the percentage you want it to be. That's in training. But what if I'm in the bed and this is completely closed? So it would be 100%? Thank you. He's getting 100% now. So if he got the bed sheets closed over this, then now he's getting 100%. And what happens to a COPD or that you give 100% oxygen to? They will die because of too much oxygen. Knock out their hypoxic drive. O2 induced hypoventilation. Says that since COPDers don't use their central chemoreceptors, right? They only use their peripheral chemoreceptors. The peripheral chemoreceptors respond to hypoxia, which is a low P little a O2. So as long as their little P, P little a O2 is low, they're breathe. Hey, breathe. Okay, thanks. I'll breathe. But when I give them 100% oxygen, I raise their PaO2 up. They're no longer hypoxic, so the body no longer tells them to breathe. Okay? So that's why this is on here. This right here makes sure that the patient does not cover up those ports. So now if I got the cover over it or something's over, it can still get that outside air to keep it bled down. Okay? So that is the reason for the safety piece. Now, being a good therapist, if, if you've got a patient on this and they're getting a breathing treatment, I can do my breathing treatment and come through this side and put some medicine through here. He can be getting medicine and oxygen at the same time, okay? But the primary reason for this safety piece is to ensure the FIO2. Because if it's not there and you close the windows, now it's 100, 100, right? All the way to the patient. There is no entrainment. Only time that oxygen can go down is if you pull in that outside air. Okay? And if I close that up, just like letting the windows back up, there's no outside entrainment. The percentage is extremely high, 100%. Okay? And then our COPDers, we can't have that. All right? So that was part of the lecture yesterday. All right, so that is a Venturi. Now, this is a nice little company who made theirs. You know, you can do all the twisting and turning and all of that. But we also have this unit here, these, right? These little colors, see these? These are also Venturi. These are little homemade Venturis, okay? Now, I don't have the safety piece that it fits on, so you have to just imagine a safety piece on it, so we lost it, okay? But it's got different colors. The different colors are different FIO2s, right? And they're the same. The yellow is always that percentage. Per pink is always 40%, right? It's never going to be like, you're not sure, okay? So how you make your own um, Venturi mask, okay? Same thing you have with this one, right? You need a mask, a short tubing, and a Venturi, okay? So I have the short piece of tubing, right? I got that. Now I need an aerosol mask. I don't know if this is going to fit on it because I tore it off. Oh, here we go. Okay. So we got an aerosol mask, right? Then I find one section of corrugated tubing, put that on there, right? Then I find the Venturi piece, put that on there, right? And then I have my small bore tubing, put that on there. Now I have made my own Venturi. Now, of course, these colorful ones do come with a medicine, I mean, a uh, protection cup, but this one doesn't fit this one because we don't have the one that it goes to, okay? But it does come with one. It would be one here and you would plug it up just like you do the other one to protect it. Now, how do you know what this is? Well, you might not can see it on my screen. See that, 40%? See it? 40% on one side. See it now? And eight liters on the other side. So what they're saying is, if I wanna get 40% from this, then I have to have this on here. If I want 40%, I have to use the pink one and I have to turn my flow right here to what? Eight. So I turn my liter flow to eight liters per minute and I'm gonna guarantee he's getting 40% FIO2 because these are designed, these are all different, right? The little windows are different. The orifice are smaller or bigger, right? Uh, so inside of there, see how that one looks? That's the pink, I mean, this is orange and the orange one is 50%, okay? Then the pink one, see, it's a little bit different. See, that hole is a little bit different. And this is 40%, right? 
Let's look at the yellow one. The yellow one. Tell me what the yellow one says. You might not see that yellow one. Is that 28? 28%. <laughs> yeah, so this one's 28. Matter of fact, let me see. I can probably put a little marker on these so they come up, show up a little bit better. So see that? It said 28% and four liters, right? See that? All right. What about this, this blue one? The blue one. The blue one is 24% at two liters. All right. All right. And uh, we did the yellow one already, right? Blue and green. We got a green one. The green one is 35%. Can you see the green one? Let me yeah, I can see that one. See that? 35% at eight liters. See that? So if I want to make my own Venturi, then I simply need a aerosol mask. This is an aerosol mask with the large holes on the side. Aerosol mask. One of my large bar tubers, one section. Remember we said one section is six inches or 50 cc's of dead space. Remember that? One section of large bar tubing and whatever. So the doctor says, put that. I want Mr. Johnson on 35% Venturi. I want him to get 35% FIO2. And I don't care how you do it, but I want to make sure he getting 35. Well, if I want to make sure he's getting, because I can put him on a nasal cannula and possibly get that percentage, but I can't guarantee it because it depends on his ventilatory pattern. But if the doctor says, I want him on 35%, period. I don't care how you give it, but he got to be on 35. Then I need to pick something that guarantees that FIO2, right? And that's a high flow device, okay? And a Venturi mask is a high flow device. So I would say, well, let me grab my Venturi 35%, right? Stick it on there, right? And it said 35 at eight liters. I will plug that there and then turn my flow meter on eight liters and he's getting 35%. No matter how he breathes, fast, slow, short, tall, okay? I can meet his demand, all right? I can guarantee 35%. I can guarantee the FIO2 with a, large, a high flow device, okay? So that's a Venturi system. You guys will make sure you look at this video. Look at my lab video I gave, because you're going to have to be able, all this stuff is going to be on the table for your lab. And Mr. Boyd or me will say, okay, show me a aerosol, put that mannequin on aerosol face tint at 45%, right? Uh, at tw 12 liters per minute. And then tell me his, tell me the, uh, the uh, total flow of that device that you just did, all right? So you're going to have to be able to know what to grab how to put it together and then work out the total flow, okay? If I say, show me a nasal cannula, you gotta be able to grab the nasal cannula and put it on the mannequin properly, okay? Uh, I mean, it's really easy as long as you looked at it. If you looked at it and studied, it's really easy, but you gotta practice it, okay? You gotta look at it, look at it, and then we have lab that day, that whole day is gonna be lab. This Friday is lab for this. It's the whole day. You're not gonna do any other lecture that day, huh? No, test is Monday. I sent y'all an announcement about that. The test is on Monday. So this is Friday, just lab, okay? So you'll be able to play with it, practice it, and then at the end of the day, you'll check off, okay? So that will be the lab. Now, so you have to understand how to do these things. So what is the principle of air and training? What's that principle called? Starts with a V. Venturi, just Venturi. V-E-N-T-U-R-I. Venturi is the principle of air entrainment, okay? Venturi is air entrainment. That's his principle. He says that as you entrain outside air, you will decrease the percentage of oxygen, which is the FIO2, okay? It's 100%. If I, got this, if I have a patient on this green flow meter, that's coming straight from oxygen. Green is oxygen. 
So in this tubing, all of this is 100% oxygen, 100% oxygen coming to that patient, right? And the only way I can deviate that percentage is if I use a Venturi system that will bring it down by bleeding in outside air, okay? And so I will use one of these Venturis to suck in this outside air and that will make the, the oxygen coming from this side lower, okay? And so they engineered these precisely to say, okay, the pink will always be 40%, right? And the yellow one will always be 28%, always for this company, okay? Uh, the orange one will always be 50%. This orange one is 50% FIO2, right? 50% at 12 liters. So if I want to do 50%, I have to buy, I mean, I have to get the orange one, right? Hook it up. Oh, have my single large bore tubing single section and my mask, all right? Now, not only do I have to have it, but I have to have the liter flow right. So 50% will only be accurate if it's at 12 liters. So then I will have to come here and kick this up to 12. And now I can guarantee 50% oxygen coming from here, okay? All right, so that's the high flow devices, okay? High flow devices, which is uh, your Venturi mask, right? Either already prepared from the store or this one. This is the same exact thing, right? Is that they got a little fancy little do that that you can open and turn it to how you want it, right? Instead of going through all these different pieces. Well, let me find this one, find that one. They say, well, just do this, right? But that's the same thing. Venturi, Venturi, and then the other ones are all aerosol, whatever. Aerosol face mask aerosol tea piece, aerosol face tint, or aerosol trait color, okay? That's the high flow devices. Now, other high flow devices, of course, would be your ventilator. That ventilator there or the machine, that's a high flow device, right? That's, that's gonna meet their demand no matter what, okay? So everything from this Venturi mask up to the ventilators are high flow oxygen devices. All right, so let me share my screen for the rest of the, uh, let, uh, the, the notes for your notes. All right, so the systems, Venturi mask, Venturi mask. That's what I just showed you. These Venturi mask here. This is a Venturi mask. It's high flow, but normally low concentrations, right? It's still high flow, but it's normally at lower concentrations, right? FL2 is between about 24% and 50%, okay? Venturi masks usually go up to about 50%. That's about as high as they can go, okay? They're based off the what principle? Venturi principle, right? So you have two principles that are involved. The Venturi principle, okay. <clears throat> now, number one, based on Bernoulli principle is when a gas passes through a restriction, the radial pressure decreases and velocity increases. So that would be this. Give me that yellow one right there. That You see that straw inside of there? That's Bernoulli. The straw. The straw, that's Bernoulli. This straw is based on the Bernoulli principle. It says when, a pa when the gas passes down through this straw, right, uh, the radial pressure decreases and velocity increases. That's Bernoulli principle, okay? Bernoulli principle. Now, Venturi says uh, pre-restriction pressure returns to normal if input doesn't deviate more than 15 degrees. So his, he says, so number two is kind of just extra information, but look at number three. Venturi sets up a specific entrainment ratio, air entrainment, right? The same FL2 always has the same what? ratio. And I showed you earlier, we did, uh, what was the first one we did that was one-to-one? -one? Was it 40%? Let's see. 60% was always one-to-one. -one. What was one-to-one? -one? Okay. Well, 60% will always be a, a ratio of one-to-one. -one. Air, one part air, one part oxygen. Always. So the same FL2 always has the same ratio. So you can either go through the list in your Egan's book, and memorize that little table. It's a little table in your Egan's book that has all of the FL2 starting from like 24 up to like, 
I don't know, 100, I'm not sure how far it goes, but it gives you the air to oxygen ratios for all of them. Some people like to memorize those. Some people like to work out the magic box, okay? It's good to do both. Memorize it if you can. If you can't, you need to be doing the magic box, okay? All right. <clears throat> the same FO2 always has the same ratio. Altering the flow rate will not alter the ratio, okay? Doesn't alter. The flow has nothing to do with the oxygen ratio, right? 60% is always one-to-one, -one, no matter how many liters I have it on. Now, the flow will affect the total flow, but not the ratio. Remember that? To find it, the total flow is when we do parts times the liter flow, right? Parts times the liter flow. Now, to find the parts, which is the air to, air, air to oxygen ratio, that's the parts, okay? Just like Judah just told us, 60% is always going to be one-to-one. -one. No matter how many liters you got among, 60% is always one-to-one. Okay, but the total flow does change depending on the liter flow because you take the parts and add them together and then multiply that by the liters per minute you have the patient on and that gives you the total flow. Okay, so I'll show it to you. I'll show it to you again. I'll get mixed, uh, confused about total flow and air to oxygen ratio. The air to oxygen ratio never is always the same with that. You need me? Uh -uh. The air to oxygen ratio never changes. Whatever the FO2 is, it's got the same uh, ratio. And I'm, I'm going to show it to you in two different ones. You gotta remember that total flow is, is depending on the flow, not the ratio. All right, so let's look at it. Magic box. always be one to one okay so let's look at it. you got 100 down here 20 up here 60 100 minus 60 is what you okay 40 60 minus 20 is 40 okay 40 divided by 40 is one part air and always what one oxygen so 60 percent it's one to one. I haven't even told you what the what they were on yet. Sixty percent is always. So the ratio does not the flow does not affect the ratio. It's always going to be one to one. Sixty percent will always be one to one. Now I'm going to show you this. Say that on an aerosol face mask of sixty percent, right, at ten liters per minute. What is the total flow? Well. We know that 60% is a one-to-one -one ratio. So first we have to get the total parts, right? TP plus T, I mean, plus liter per minute. So TP, I'm sorry. TP is total parts, right? So the TP would be what? Two, two total parts. One part air, one part oxygen. Total parts is one plus one is what? Two. To find the total flow, total flow is total parts times the liters per minute, LPM. So in this case, the total parts is what? What's the total parts? Two times, what's the liter per minute? 10. So the total flow in this case is what? 20 liters per minute. 20 liters per minute is the total flow. That's on this, right? Let's say we change the flow to see if it changes our liters, our ratio. Well, what if I have the patient on? What if I have the patient on 60% aerosol face mask at 
20 liters per minute. All right. Is that going to change my ratio? 60% will always be what? One to one. So just because I went up on my liters per minute does not change my ratio, but it will change my total flow. Okay. It doesn't change my ratio, but it will change my total flow. So let's see what the total flow of this one is. First, you find your this. So total, so, so the total parts is how many? Two. And so total flow equals uh, total parts times liters per minute. What's the total parts? Two times what's the total flow? I mean, what's the liters per minute? 20 now. So what's the total flow? Huh? 40 liters per minute. So look, the total flow changed, but the ratio doesn't. So just because I went up on the liters per minute on my device does not change the ratio. Okay? So that's what they're trying to tell you. Changing the flow does not affect the ratio. FIO2 will have the same ratio every time. 60% will always be one to one. All right? Let's see what another one is. So let's say 50% uh, oxygen. 50% oxygen will always be what? What's 100 minus 50 is what? 50. And 50 minus 20 is what? 30. So what's 50 divided by 30? One point six. So it would always be one point six to what? One. The air is an O2. Fifty percent will always be one point six to one, no matter what. No matter how many liters I have them on, that doesn't change. It's fifty percent. As long as I didn't change the, the FO2. But the same FO2 always has the same ratio every time. Fifty percent will always be one point six to one. Okay? What about uh, do uh, do uh, 45%. FIO2 of 45%. 100 minus 45 is what? 55. And 45 minus 20 is what? 25. So 55 divided by 25 is what? Huh? 2.2 to what? One. So 45%, I don't care what they got it on. The ratio never changes. 45% will always be 2.2 to 1. All right? And then to time find the total flow, of course, I would add these two right here together and multiply by whatever liter flow I got them on, and that will be my total flow. Total flow changes, ratio doesn't. Okay? So total flow, you understand now, Judith? Total flow changes with the flow, but ratio never changes. If, if, if you have them on this FIO2, it's going to always be that ratio. 45% FIO2 will always be 2.2 to 1. All right. What about 28%? What you'll see the most in the hospital. You see 28 and 40 all the time. So 28%, 100 minus 28 is what? 72. And 28 minus 20, 8. So 72 divided by 8. Okay. So 9 parts air and how many parts O2? 1. So 28% will always be a ratio of what? 9 to 1. How many total parts is this? 10. Okay. So you take that 10 and multiply whatever you got them on, and that will be your flow. Okay. All right. All right, moving right along. All right. Move on with the lesson plan. All right. Now, so first you said, uh, the same FIO2 always has the same ratio. Alternating the flow will not mess with the ratio, okay? Now, other than the prescribed flow rate will give the same FIO2. 
Let's go. Altering the flow rate will alter the total output. See, we just showed you that. If I change the flow rate on my uh, machine, right? If I have my, my device, if I change that liters per minute, then that's gonna change my total flow, right? I just showed you that over on the board. Now, the flow rate does not alter the ratio. The FL2 will have the same ratio no matter what flow you have it on. But the flow will change the total flow. So if I increase the flow on my device, then my total flow is going to increase, okay? All right. Now, what do we talk about? Number three, that's the Venturi device. That's why we have this protection piece here. Number three says FL2 will be altered by altering the port, right? So if I close this port off completely, they're going to get all that oxygen. So watch for the what? Bed sheets. When you have a patient that's on a Venturi mask, Make sure it's outside the bed sheet, not up under the cover. A lot of patients want to be tucked up and all under the covers and stuff, but you got to make sure that that de Venturi device, right, one of these, or if it's the one like this, you have to make sure it's outside of that because if it is closed off, it's going to give them 100% oxygen. And you're going to go back in there to your COPD or Mr. Johnson, and he's going to be dead. Okay? So you have to be very careful. All right, some other high flow devices. Some other high flow devices we're going to talk about the mist tent or the croupette, right? Uh, the mist tent, croupette, isolate, the head box, uh, the aerosol setup, cascades, right? And then hyperbaric therapy we will do on tomorrow. So tomorrow is what? Thursday? So tomorrow we will finish the lecture. Tomorrow we will finish the lecture and review whatever we need to review. And Friday will be a whole day of lab, okay? So tomorrow we're gonna to talk about the other machines, the mist tent, that's the one with the baby is in. You know how you have to put your hands through it, through the little holes on the side? You know what I'm talking about? The isolate, well, that's the isolate. Uh, you have an isolate for newborns, you have to stick your hands in and, and deal with them through the holes. That's the incubator, right? That's an isolate. That's an isolate. They also call it an incubator. Uh, you have a mist tent or the croupette, right? Head box, aerosol setups. Tomorrow we'll we'll go over the, the uh, PowerPoint where you can see these a little bit better in detail because we don't have the isolate and all that here at the school, okay? But I do have uh, photos and all that in the PowerPoint. So if you like to go on or look on, you can, but we will start that part tomorrow. Tomorrow we will start with the mist tent and croupette, talking about the isolate and all those. And then we're going to get into what's called hyperbaric therapy. So I want you tonight to read up on hyperbaric therapy and understand uh, what it is to go down more atmospheres. Remember, sea level is a barometric pressure of 760. But sometimes we go down a couple of more atmospheres and it increases the ability of oxygen because oxygen now has a higher millimeter of mercury pressure at a lower altitude, okay? So we're gonna talk about that tomorrow. Homework for tonight. Homework for tonight for your attendance and being graded uh, will be homework numbers one and two from this section. So homework 210G, homework number one and two is due tonight by midnight. I'm gonna put that in the announcement. I'm gonna put it in your canvas, but that's all I'm doing. I'm telling you now, and I'm putting it in the announcement and in Canvas. I'm not emailing everybody, calling everybody. Now, we all grown. You're supposed to check your emails, check your correspondence to understand what's going on in your class, okay? I've just told you. I'm going to put it in the announcement as well as the Canvas, all right? I will see you guys tomorrow. Be prepared to talk about these other high-flow devices. For what? Huh? I mean, it's, it's, we're going to do it tomorrow.